ensure that they have these qualities that you see listed in the chat box. So thanks. I'm going to be, uh, Janine, I'm going to move on to the next slide. If you want to give us a quick history of why I'm getting so excited about the answers that I'm seeing in the chat box today. I would love that, Ernie. Uh, we're so excited because the, the, the kinds of things that you're talking about are the kinds of things that we heard from uh, community members, including young people, educators, families, business owners, um, uh, across our state since we've begun these conversations since October 2022. Um, and so in the chat, I put the website portrait.nvfutureoflearning.org. And I would invite you to jump on there while I'm talking <laughs> to organically connect with the content. We've really uh, purposefully tried to capture all of the elements of the experience that we had talking with community across Nevada. And as the work continues, Continues to evolve, we'll continue to demonstrate what is happening there. So we really invite you to, um, you know, jump on <laughs> as we're having this conversation. But the, but the work of conversations and sort of grounding into who do Nevadans want young people to be and why, and, and what is a good life in a thriving community and what does it take to make that happen started in October of 22, uh, October 2022. And we had 200 Nevadans come together uh, to really spend about two days thinking, processing, engaging, reflecting on uh, the current state of our education system and how we might evolve it together. This initiative really is the Nevada Department of Education's answer to what they heard so many people say coming out of COVID that we have an obligation not to let education just move back to go back to normal. And while so many pieces and parts um, sometimes feel like that, that is what has happened, we also know that change takes real change, deep change, sustainable change takes time. And this is the investment in bringing community together to make sure that can happen. Young people, as you can see on our website under Youth Voice, young people have been engaged in reflecting and thinking about and building artifacts of what matters to them in their learning. Um, Felicia uh, Ortiz, who we'll hear from in just a moment, was one of several uh, leaders and community members that we interviewed virtually to help us put out a series of conversations to the community, also on the website, about what was important to them as they thought about how education and school can help move good lives and thriving communities forward. And you'll see here that this draft portrait, we call it draft one, is sort of a visualization of the data that we heard coming out of all of these focus groups and conversations. And over the next four months between January and April, we took that draft. We had surveys that went out about it. We had focus groups and listening circles that occurred. And one of the things I'm, I think Ernie and I are most proud of is that we brought 13 teams of educators across the state together to quote unquote pilot the portrait. And on the website, you can see that under um, I think it's portrait pilot. And what we did was they took this draft of a portrait and they started to look at things that were happening in their communities. In some districts, they have their own portrait or profile of a learner and graduate. Um, in some schools, they have uh, norms and values that they're working towards. And they looked at alignment with this emerging data. They built an innovation priority that looked like it was in connection to this work, but was also connected deeply to work they cared about already that they were trying to move forward on behalf of students. And you can see their case studies. All of these educators came and presented to the Nevada Association of School Superintendents in June. And in just like four or five short months, they were able to stand up just some basic examples of the kinds of work that would be happening to bring portrait work to life inside schools. And these educators have been so informa informative to all of us as we are one, we're trying to finalize um, a, a portrait that we could start more deeply working with. And that is also on the website and you can click on it where it says view portrait. Um, and on the second page, I think portrait, you can also see it in, in English and in Spanish. And so that, that portrait really is a vision of who uh, we can be as learners and the different kinds of descriptions and categories that came out of that. We had, gosh, panels of over 60, I think two different panels of folks across the state doing feedback and iteration on this portrait. And so, um, 
you know, we've had a lot of educator input, we've had a lot of community input. And the one thing that we've heard but widely is yes, we need this. We want young people to be the integration of mindsets and skills and that they can take their knowledge and do something with it. And we need to make school more relevant in those ways. And what does that look like? What is the support that's gonna be needed and how are we gonna sustain that? Because that's what everybody really says, yes. And how do we make that happen? Ernie, can we go to the next slide? And so that that is where I would love to invite our fantastic State Board of uh, um, State Board Education President Felicia Ortiz into the conversation. Um, Felicia, thank you so much for joining us today. You were um, one of the people that suggested we even host a session at this conference because you are so passionate about making sure that this work gets on everybody's radar as much as possible. Um, so thank you. And also, um, I think I'll just dive right in and just say, you know, you're really an incredible advocate for educators and for the profession. You're a curious learner. You're always asking questions. You're in many different rooms locally and nationally. Can you just tell us a little bit about why this work has really especially like resonated with you right now? Um, I think it comes down to the kids and the teachers, um, bottom line. So the thing I hear most from kids is that they want to be more challenged, more um, interested in what they're learning. They want to know why they're learning what they're learning. They want relevant education that's going to help them in their future. The number one thing I hear from high school kids every time I talk to them is I want to learn life skills. <laughs> and um, what I'm learning, I don't feel like I can apply. And then when I talk to teachers, they're like, I feel hamstrung. I feel stuck. I feel like I don't have the autonomy I need to really um, be innovative and thrive and get to address all my kids in the way that they need to be addressed. Um, especially because our kids all learn at different paces and learn in different ways. And um, that's hard. It's even harder to do with some of the class sizes we've got right now. We're working on that. <laughs> um, but I think this is one of the solutions. And I think this is really what I'm hearing across the country. Um, one of the best ways to kind of shift education to what both kids need and the community is asking for, um, business is asking for, and frankly, educators. They, they love to be able to meet their kids where they're at and teach them um, things beyond just what's in a textbook. So I'm excited about it. I talk about it all the time. Um, it's kind of my favorite topic lately. So yeah, I'm, I just, I see so much good that could come of it and like what it could mean for the future of our state. And so I'm excited. Yeah. You know, Felisa, you are a business owner in our community as well. And I think sometimes there, as I've been um, really uh, so grateful to be able to lead conversations in so many different spaces. It's funny, sometimes I think sometimes people feel like maybe perhaps business community is at odds with like this concept of just human development. But like I hear people who are concerned about social emotional well being say and saying the same things that I'm hearing from business community. Um, they come at it sometimes from a different angle, but it actually really overlaps is what I'm learning. And I'd love if you could speak a little bit about like when you look at the actual portrait that I think you were actually on our portrait perspectives panel too. So you were one of those 60 plus people giving feedback to the portrait we have arrived at. Um, what on that portrait really jumps out at you that feels connected to being a business owner and just being like having a space, a sense of well-being? Honestly, there, there's two major things. And I actually, I keep it on my desk. It's not, I have a mess right now, but I keep it on my desk because that's how, how often I reference it. But there's, I would say two, maybe three major things. Number one, um, coming purely from a business owner perspective and thinking from that hat, um, communication skills and those soft skills is the number one thing that both myself and other business owners look for in our future employees or current employees. All the technical stuff, we can train them on that, right? Um, the soft skills are so critical, especially in so many of our industries. I work in tech and while the technology stuff is important, knowing how to communicate with people and how to turn that technical speak into something that they can get and is relevant to them is so priceless. So that's number one. Number two is 
um, something that I hear from community members, people in various organizations. I sit on multiple boards. Uh, it's knowing your own mental health and like how to um, how to not only help yourself, but help others. And that's a thing I hear from kids too, that they want to learn more about. We haven't, we haven't done a super great job of addressing mental health as a nation in general, but kids are so on it lately. Um, and I'm actually hearing that coming more and more from adults. So they want to know, like, I want to know what, how to help my friends. And adults say, I want my kid to be able to self-regulate, right? And so that kind of stuff is super important. And then, of course, on top of all of that, the joy in learning. <laughs> um, that's the biggest one for me. And that always resonates at the top because if they're not enjoying it, they're not going to show up. And I would love, my dream is that all kids... Um, when they come to school and when they leave our doors, that they have found a joy for learning that lives on with them for the rest of their lives, that nobody leaves our doors and says, that's it, I'm done learning, that they are constantly learning for the rest of their lives. Um, so that's the goal. <laughs> You know, I appreciate that. And we put some links in, you know, Ernie mentioned soft skills and durable skills. Uh, the durable skills research from America Succeeds is something that we've, re we've refer referenced often. Um, this is research that was done around jobs right now, 80 million jobs over a two year time period and what the key skills were that people were looking for. And we just put that link in so that you can also see sort of the crosswalk of some of the things that really ended up in the portrait and how those things are alive and well. And I would just also like to like plus one, what I heard you say about young people talking about mental health and well-being in nearly every conversation that we, I, I actually can't think of a conversation that we had across the state where mental health and or well-being um, was um, not brought up by young people as a critical concern. And and the broader, the deeper conversations we've all had around that really seem to be this sense of connection and purpose to what they're learning, to the people they're in relationship with when they are learning, um, and that they're doing things that build that sense of community and relationship while they are learning. And so I think they're words, they are words that we have often spoken a lot about in education, but it's also kind of about reframing what that actually means um, in the learner experience on a daily basis. And then what we also know and the department knows, what do we have to reframe at the systems level to be able to actually in, um, make that possible for young people and educators to do on a daily basis? You know, Felicia, you hear so much um, uh, that you hear, you know, the state board has so many issues before it. <laughs> Um, there are so many conversations that are very topical right now um, in our Nevada community around education. Um, why do you think, do you think, well, first of all, do you think the portrait can play a role in bringing some coherence and alignment to all of these conversations? Um, and if so, oh, like in what ways? A hundred percent. And I'll tell you the biggest one right now, right? Um, especially for those of you educators down south, I'm supporting you and I am with you in your struggles lately. Um, but one of the things that I think would make a massive difference to retain teachers and attract teachers is to, and I'm gonna say educators, because I mean everybody, not just teachers, um, is to make it a more fun place to be, right? Um, and not only, addressing the mental health stuff for kids, but for adults as well. And so I think that inevitably, right, when we teach stuff to others, we learn ourselves. So there's some um, waterfall effect in all of this, but I think that it will, um, it'll bring the joy back to learning. It'll bring the joy back to teaching and it will help us to, I think, address some of the major challenges we face today chronic absenteeism, right? If kids are interested and they're learning stuff that they like, they're gonna show up more. Um, the teacher shortage, hopefully teachers will hear about this and say, oh my gosh, I wanna teach that way. I wanna be in a classroom where I'm helping kids at their pace, where I'm not limited to like X minutes per subject. And if you're seven, you're in first grade, everything, like that's kind of just 
hopefully an old <laughs> theory that'll go away eventually. Um, we like the competency-based model here in Nevada, and that's what we're trying to push towards. And I think that will attract innovative and um, experienced teachers that that know that that's the right way to teach, right? I've been in many, many classrooms that they're doing it already. Um, even though the rules don't necessarily give them all of the freedom that they need. So I think that'll really help the um, love of teaching to come back into the profession. And it will generate a whole new generation of teachers, right? When kids see teachers loving and enjoying what they're doing, guess what? They're going to want to be them too. And so hopefully, right, that will end up generating a new generation of teachers that are excited to come back into the schools that they grew up in and teach the next generation. Yeah, Felicia, thank you for taking a few moments to share some of the things that really connect with you about the work. I think it's so valuable to create space for our um, leaders like you to be able to engage directly with educators who are learning and thinking and advocating. Um, and thank you for continuing to join in this conversation as the session um, uh, proceeds. Uh, Ernie, I think I'll jump in maybe to the next slide, which is, I think the answer to a lot of people's questions, which is great, we have this vision. <laughs> so many people believe in so many common things, like so what, now what? Um, are we going to get stuck in this space where we are talking about these great things and, but what are we doing to make it happen? And so this year, this, this next year, now that the, the conversations have happened and will continue, I'm giving you a glimpse into what is now becoming the Nevada Future of Learning Network, which is to support the sustainability of the concept of the portrait um, through many different um, uh, pathways. And so you'll see that there are school design teams, which is really the next iteration on our portrait pilot schools. So we were able to learn from that work that educators did, the feedback that they gave us. Um, and, and Ernie will talk more about this in just a moment, so I won't, I won't go too deep now. But there's work that's being done by school and district teams. There's work happening inside classrooms with educators around the competencies. There are educator ambassadors who are stepping up as leaders to help bring um, message and support conversations and engagement with educators across Nevada. There is a youth cohort that is actually at our office right now meeting, um, uh, comprised of young people around the state who are developing their own leadership and advocacy um, uh, around the things that are important to them um, aligned to the portrait. And we'll be having a policy advisory committee that is looking at the work that is happening in these different pathways and starting to identify the barriers and the opportunities so that the department is clear on that so that learning can be part of a coherent um, next set of policy steps. Around that, there will be community engagement work that is happening this year. And by work, I mean portrait parties where people in different organizations are coming together to learn about the portrait, to eat together, to talk about, wait, I, you want to be, you want to be collaborative in your classroom, but I need you to do that in my job, my business too. And this is the, the, the intersection between school and community. And then certainly there's a group of folks this year also really looking at all of that work that you see before you, thinking more deeply about network sustainability. What does this look like the next two years, the next four years, the next five years? And so um, that work is just really coming together right now. And I'd love to pass it to Ernie to think a little bit, talk a little bit more deeply about the things that educators are really doing um, in this work right now. Thanks, Janine. As you were speaking, I was thinking of so many different things and I'm, I'm wondering where I want to start with this. I would like to share that it went way back in 1979, when I graduated from college with my degree in education, I thought that I knew what was expected of me as a teacher. In other words, I knew certainly that uh, families would want me to be teaching content to their student, you know, to their children. And I knew that to some degree I was expected to behave in public, you know, that I was supposed to be a model of, be a model citizen in many ways. Um, there's always that unspoken curriculum uh, that, you know, in essence, we should be, we're, we're told we should be modeling for our students. And yet in the past few years, 
those assumptions were based on my own experience within education. It was not taking into account the experiences of all my students and what they bring to the classroom. And so as this portrait was coming together and as we were visiting with teams in six different counties last year, um, I realized that my guiding star, if you will, my compass point, my assumptions about what the public expects of teachers was not complete. And so the portrait, because of the collaborative nature of this, I've never seen Nevada and Nevada's teachers invited to this degree to engage and be part of the building of the portrait. I cannot recall a time when this many teachers and business people and other stakeholders and families were all brought together to discuss what are the qualities that we think our children should have, not only by the time they leave school, but also within school, while they're in school. And so the portrait was being developed going through all that last year, shifting our minds, if you will, to not make assumptions and to see this portrait as, okay, here's the overall within Nevada. This is what we would like to see within our students. And so as I look at this, I'm looking at Clark County, I'm looking at Lincoln County, looking at Elko and Churchill, Mineral County, and Washoe County. I don't know how many of you have traveled through Nevada, but I can share with you that what I see here in my part of Clark County is a lot different than what I see up in Elko County. And it's way different than what I see in Churchill County or Lincoln County. So the excitement of working with teams across the state is a wonderful experience, but it's also helpful to find what do we have in common with each other? What are the commonalities that all families across the state would like to see in their children as they're going through school? So last year, we worked with 13 different teams and about 50 different educators from the counties that you see listed here. We also had another unusual element. It wasn't just one RPD, RPDP working on this. It was a team created of the RPDP uh, units here in Nevada. So each team was tasked with designing a project that connected the portrait with what were priorities, priorities at their schools. And so it's interesting to think about. Uh, earlier, Janine mentioned other school districts and schools have already have a portrait or a profile. Churchill County is one of those. And yet they were able to, uh, they're focusing directly on their portrait in Churchill County schools, but then also to take the Nevada portrait with that. And what they focused on was facilitating students being able to see the why in what they were learning. Yeah, today we're going to be, forgive my horrible example, today we're going to be reading Shakespeare. Why is that? <laughs> Why is that important to me as a seventh grade student, right? Um, so they focused a little bit on the why. Uh, Elko County uh, at one of the elementary schools was making STEM a reality for their students, uh, encouraging them to think about the different roles that engineers play and, and the skills that they use to be engineers. Um, it, nothing more enchanting than working with second graders who are not only excited to show you how their seedlings are growing, but also how they're writing about they want to be a chef. And here's why gardening connects with the career that they want to be engaged with it, it, when they get older. Um, so each school team or school district team, depending on where they were, created uh, a different project connecting the portrait again to what they're something that they wanted to either change or improve in their schools. It was so exciting. And it was even more exciting is this year we've evolved. We now have over 25 teams. These are school design teams. And we've also expanded which districts are we have representation from. So we're adding to the list that you see at the top. We're adding Story, Douglas, White Pine, and Nye counties. So we're working with about 125 teachers. And I'm really emphasizing again teachers. Because while there might be an administrator or there might be, um, I don't want to say facilitator, uh, but a coach or uh, an instructional coach of some sort representing the team, a counselor might be on the team. The primary members of our teams are classroom teachers. So it's really exciting to see, and, and we will see, we're meeting with them in the middle of October to get started with this year's um, project. How What would they do with the portrait? Where do they see the portrait really guiding them as they work with their students. And so we think again, uh, earlier 
somebody mentioned the curiosity and the joy and the inspiration. These are areas that we want to make sure our students get to experience and skills that they develop, that they do learn what collaboration is all about, how to problem solve. And so a couple examples, if you will, of how that worked out. You'll see a QR code there on the right that should take you to a page where we have all of last year's pilot examples uh, addressed. You might have to scroll down on the page, but really quickly, uh, some that come to mind immediately here in Las Vegas, LEAD STEM Academy, uh, certainly if you're a science, technology, engineering, or a mathematics teacher, you're well aware of STEM and your role within STEM. But what about the English and the social studies teachers? So literally they took the skills that describe a STEM way of instructing and they defined them so that it was more inclusive with those teachers and students who were working outside of the STEM designation, if you will. Meadow Valley Middle School up in Lincoln County, up in Panaca. The principal noticed, please know in uh, Panaca, the middle school has four classrooms. So the principal gets to know all the students pretty well there. And what Doc realized was that the students were making some choices that we all know are not the best choices for an early adolescent to make, uh, involving perhaps alcohol or some other substances that they were checking out, experimenting with, uh, and some other activities they were engaging in. And he thought, well, we can say don't do this all we want, but that's not, that's not going to stop this. So instead, they created, thinking again with the STEM background, they created a medical they created a, a, a health uh, fair, if you will. The middle school students did some research on the impact of smoking, the effects of too much alcohol. Uh, they took a look at all these different concerns and they engaged, if you will, in self-learning about why maybe they weren't making the best choices for them at this age. Uh, they also opened up the school. They had stethoscopes and blood pressure monitors. They were able to do some health screenings for the people who lived at Panaca. That's another example. And again, they're restoring that joy to learning in doing so. The students were collaborating. They were problem solving. Uh, it was important uh, to know that problem-based or project-based uh, education is a great way to look at this because they were solving real life problems. And in doing that, that encouraged them to learn more about the problem. So they're learning content at the same time. Mineral County. Uh, since the Army post really is backed off, since they're not storing munitions there, I'm not sure if that's the right term, uh, but since they're not as busy as they once were as a thriving community, uh, they wanted to take a look, actually working with um, another nonprofit that they're working with to bring meaning to the students about each other and about their education. So their project involved connecting the high school students with the elementary and middle school students, and how would they... Uh, how would they share what they were learning with each other? Literally, they took um, some different statements from the students and the high school students printed those up on t-shirts, which were given to the younger students. So they're developing that feeling of belonging, that feeling of, of identity and understanding, I am here in this community and this is why it's important that I'm in this community. So those are just three examples of portrait projects and you can read more. You can also read about uh, some of the youth work as well with the link that's at the bottom of that uh, slide that we're showing right now. While we had our portrait teams working, our design, school design teams working, there were also teachers from across the state who were working with competencies. So we've got the version of the profile that we're using right now, the portrait that we're using right now, excuse me. So how do we make this personalized? What do these terms mean and what is a competency, right? Uh, so to think about that, and I'm pausing to give you a moment if you're thinking, yeah, how do I personalize my instruction? I mean, it was important for me to learn personalized doesn't mean the student walks in and says, okay, I wanna learn about auto mechanics and that's all I wanna learn about. No, that's not how it works. <laughs> but how do we connect the students to the learning? And how do we ensure that they have decisions in their learning plan so that they'll learn in ways that make it most interesting and most impactful for them? And then with competency, how do we truly measure if a student understands? 
So we had other teachers from across the state working to create, once they had the descriptors, if you will, for the four parts of our portrait, then they started creating the competencies that go with those statements. So for example, under thriving, uh, the group that worked on competencies for that area focused on the word resilience. And so what they wanted to point out that a competency, you know, what is the measure of a student who is thriving? It's when we see a learner who is investigating and adapting to different opportunities as they continuously learn, unlearn, relearn in ways that will support them becoming productive, continuing, contributing members of their community. So the thriving group so far to this day has created one competency. Uh, you'll see other groups created more than one competency, but we focused on the four pillars of the portrait, thriving, impacting, empowering, connecting. And so with that, uh, while the competencies are still in a stage of being finalized, uh, we also have uh, teachers continuing that work through what we call competency champions. Last year, it was 60 of us working together, meeting every so often. I forget how many weeks we met for three and two and a half hours at a time as we built those competencies. But now they're stretching out to be school teams, if you will, of two to three champions continuing to develop the competencies, but also putting the competencies into action in their classrooms. So we're trying it out with, with the idea of uh, say, okay, what works? Where, where are we seeing this as evident when we describe the competency in this way? And then um, in addition to that, these competency champions will be tasked with creating toolkits. Because the question I hear most often from teachers is how is this implemented? And what do you mean? One more thing, right? Why do we have one more thing on our plates? And that's where I come back and say, it's not so much implementing this as much as using this as a tool to guide the decisions that you make with instruction for your students. And so Janine, I think we go back to you. How do we make all this come together in our state? Yeah, well, when we think about, thanks Ernie, like I think that one of the things that I really appreciate about what you just shared are this is really grassroots educator research and development that is happening to inform what this is. And one of as a as a 12 plus year educator, I was a secondary educator in Clark County for uh, during my teaching career, like the idea of bringing educators together across the state to research and develop and inform practice and policy was to me so critical <laughs> because those closest to the challenges need to be empowered with the voice um, to not just solve the challenges, but to also offer the ongoing iteration of what's happening and what needs to evolve because they know. So this work started, I mean, really we can go back to 2017 when there was some work set up around a competency-based learning network. Um, uh, and really, I think the work took off uh, during COVID uh, when a national partner came in and worked with the department on a Blue Ribbon Commission to start to think about what kinds of policies might need to evolve in this moment. That led to a space coming out of COVID of action planning, listening, and learning. And then we jumped into the 2022 October space where we started to really talk more deeply about designing a portrait, having a shared vision through which all of this work would be brought together coherently. And then we're in the phase now, we're over this past year, we rebuilt the portrait, we piloted some network strategies. Um, now we're really launching this Nevada Future of Learning Network and all those pathways are folks who are in the network to really engage, support, research, develop, and share with coherence. And the next stage of that is because we're doing that, the integration of what we're learning is going to come into practice and policy. And so that's what's so really powerful to me about this work. And that over this next year, we'll be, you know, activating stage three and 
also moving into stage four. Um, and not moving into stage four, I don't think you're going to see anything happen in policy like in the next year. But what's going to start to happen is the learning that's happening is going to start to impact a policy platform that can then do that um, over the next few years. Uh, and I think I just also wanted to say that I saw the question in the chat about the NEPF and I started answering it and then um, already passed it back to me. So I'm just going to um, answer that, that you know, I was an educator who also worked with the NEPF. Um, it comes up quite a bit in some of our more informal conversations when we're talking with educators about what are the things that really need to feel aligned and be true um, in order for this work to feel seamlessly integrated. And the NEPF comes up all the time because of evaluation. It's interesting. I. I hear different things from different people. Oh, I see this in the NEPF here <laughs> or here or here. And then also, well, if this is really explicitly what we're working towards, the NEPF isn't saying that. So, um, you know, just like Lloyd brought up in the chat, like how might an educator portrait or profile emerge um, alongside this work? We see in other systems, particularly at state and district levels, um, or even like national levels. We've studied some countries that do work like this. Um, and Lloyd was there for that, Singapore. Um, when this kind of work takes place, typically the student vision informs an educator version, maybe even a leadership profile. Sometimes in the state of Virginia, they have a portrait of a classroom. Um, that sort of like what are the environment and the physicality that needs to involve that so um it's on the radar i wouldn't say that like immediately the i cannot give you a the nepf is evolving like this but it is absolutely on the radar and because we have educators in this conversation i'm very confident that it will continue to be something that is iterated on and addressed um and just so you know it's noted again because of this conversation today <laughs> so ernie i'll pass it back to you to sort of wrap us up and create space for everybody to engage a little bit more Okay, thank you. And I'm catching up here on the, there we go. Okay, thanks. Uh, I believe, you know, it's funny, I put these codes in here, and I forget what this one takes us to. Jenny, and if you'll just kind of check and remind me. It, it goes to the pathways, so the different very good. Okay. can apply, yeah. <laughs> That's what I was hoping. <laughs> so, okay. Um, earlier, Janine shared a little bit about what's happening across the state. And so specifically for teachers, where we find the most interest uh, are the school design teams. As I mentioned, we've already, uh, we're literally working on the contracts with the fellows uh, on this, uh, that we've accepted their applications to be teams. Uh, they put together up to seven from their school who can be on this design school design team. And they'll work with a coach throughout the year, again, connecting the portrait with the work that they're doing at their schools. The competency champions are definitely seeking, while all teachers are welcome, they, they have to limit the number, um, all teachers are welcome to apply, but they are really seeking for input from rural school districts, rural areas. Um, you know, Clark County is so big and we have so many teachers here in the county that we fill up right away and yet we want to hear from all of the counties as well so if you're if you're in clark county of course please feel encouraged to apply to be a competency champion uh on the other hand if you are outside of clark county or outside of washoe um i can say we, we are we would really additionally welcome your engagement with the competency champions the ambassadors right now are working on developing a network of teachers who will be engaged with this work. And so uh, with that, uh, please keep an eye out for connecting with them. Uh, you know, as emails come through, if you ever see anything that says future of learning network, take a look at it because that's somehow connected with the work that we're doing. Um, Janine, I don't know if you wanted to mention October 13th here. Uh, sorry to put you on the spot, uh, but I think there's a link to show interest in that as well. Okay, there um, we go. Thanks. Well, yeah. that's our that's our our listserv right there. To, and if you're not a part of it, um, we would invite you to sign up for information. And to Ernie's point, we have the this Nevada Future of Learning launch is happening October 13th and 14th. In Las Vegas, it'll be at Spring Valley High School. The evening of the 13th is for all the folks who are in all of these pathways and it's open to the community writ large um, up until we reach capacity, which is I think about 400 to 500 folks. So we've got some room left, um, but uh, the, and it's sort of an interactive experience where young people have actually co-designed uh, an experience that everyone, it will 
that will be interactive and will help bring the ideas and the feelings and the sights and the sounds of the portrait to life. And then we'll have an opportunity to converse together and think more deeply about the experience and the work that's happened and the work that's happening. Again, that'll be October 13th in Las Vegas. Um, and so if you're on the um, listserv, you'll get the invites that have the, the save the dates have gone out, but the invites to actually register are coming out this week. And then um, those folks that are actually in one of these navy blue pathways uh, will be all convening on Saturday to kick off their work, which is really exciting. Thanks so much. And yeah, I think that link is most important of all because you'll just get periodic updates and in there, if, if there's uh, opportunity to engage with us, uh, it, it, those links will be shared in there as well. Uh, I would say another way is to invite us. Uh, invite us to come out and visit your school, to speak with your families. Uh, we're happy to do that. Um, I would love to see this map of Nevada filled with a star on every county, if you want, um, with our portrait teams and, and all the work that we're doing. Uh, so stay in touch. That link, again, that Janine shared in the chat most recently, uh, looks like a MailChimp kind of link. Um, if you look at that, uh, sign up, then you'll be getting regular information about where we're at with the portrait. Um, to that end, I would say, uh, please note our contact information here. Take a photo. Again, reach out to any of us with your questions, with your ideas, with your concerns. Um, I do want to stop, Janine, because I noticed the time. And I, I'm curious if there are questions or concerns that you might want to mention either in the chat uh, or those of you who are here, if you want to just ask out. What questions do you have about the portrait? Yeah, please, please let us know. We want your feedback. And also connections that you're making as well, things that you're connecting with and wonderments that you have. If anything like got you really excited, can you put it in the chat? Cause I wanna know. Well, just real quick, as a person who's been in the district as an educator for 29 years, and also who's somebody who graduated and has two children that graduated from Clark County, I'm just really excited for all of this. This is wonderful that we're going to have all of these great opportunities and to build the portrait of a Nevada learner because a Nevada learner is different than any other learner that I know about. And that's a good thing. Yeah. We're actually, um, we were featured in an article recently, kind of leading the country. Um, there's a couple of other states that are a bit ahead of us on this type of work, but um, our ability to get people involved from around the state, thank you, Janine and Arnie, has been um, recognized. And the fact that we're involving educators and young people so greatly in the work, um, I'm, I'm just excited for that. I think that it's gonna make all the difference People frequently, especially when I, you know, bring up policy stuff, oh, we can't do that. I say, guess what? Turn it to the kids and the educators and they'll find a way because who better, right? Um, and so I think this is, this is a huge opportunity for us. Any other thoughts, comments, suggestions? Oh, look at you. Thank you, Janine. We catalog them on our news and resources page. So again, trying to keep a transparent space. So, uh, but yeah, those are, that's the, that's the space. And I think that's the Edwig article you're referencing, Felicia. Uh -huh. It is. <laughs> All right. Does that bring us about to a close? Think so. Thanks so, Nathan. I believe it Thank does. You. Thank you, Thank so you everyone. Much. Thank you so much for for coming and being a part of this. It's such amazing work. Um, for the attendees, I have added the session survey to the chat. Also, in case you missed the attendance survey, um, I'm gonna go ahead and put it back in. It was a little earlier, but please do both of these. Okay, and he put these done, um, so we can get you credit. And. At 3.10, there's going to be a session in here by yours truly. <laughs> it's, uh, I'm, so, I'm changing hats from moderator to presenter, uh, talking about uh, making a difference, how teachers can change lives. So um, if anyone would like to stay for that, please 
feel free. Um, if not, then once you have the, those forms fill out, you are free to go to your next session. The next session in all rooms starts at 310. Nathan, uh, your your session sounds amazing. I wish I could stay. Basically, Ad Adriana's yeah. coming. You, sh you should stay. <laughs> I'll, see, I'll see for I'll see for a little bit. Um, I I just, in my personal opinion, I'm a little biased because my mommy was a teacher, but I I literally feel like every teacher changes lives every day that they show up to a classroom because you never know what a kid's going through or what they're feeling and how like you might literally change the trajectory of their life just by being there. Right. And that that's kind of the one Sorry. of the major <laughs> that's kind of one of the major points of the session too is just, you know, in the hustle and bustle, sometimes we forget, right? Or reasons why mm -hmm. they, they can change. And it's uh, to share stories, you know, educators sharing stories about, you know, those moments that that you make an impact. So <laughs> Yeah, no, I could, I could almost literally think of every year of school, what a teacher, like, something they did for me. So, yeah, special. Heroes, well, they're her heroes. I'm a product of CCSD, and I can't say the same, but I, I do remember Ms. Bumpus in, in fourth grade. <laughs> she, was, she was pretty great. Um, but all together, I mean, it's, I don't know. I think that that now that we have educators that are products of CCSD um, and the school system in Nevada, I just think that it 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 is it just comes full circle. You know, like there are my teachers are in this conference. <laughs> like it's uh, you know, like I'll see them at events. <laughs> it's, uh, I was That's at new, awesome. Yeah, at the new teacher kickoff. I'm like, Mr. Mickle, what's up, man? Um, and it's just kind of funny because it's like. I don't know. They're, 